On today's show, we talk to a woman who experienced profound trauma and she's worried about her boyfriend. We also talk to a woman with a special needs child who is worried about her career. We talk to a husband whose daughter experienced trauma and he wants to know how to help. Stay tuned. What up, what up? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show. We talk about your mental health, your relationships, what's going on in your heart, in your mind, in your families, in your schools, in this country. So glad that you're with us. Quick note, if you're watching this on the tubes, on the, on the internets, on the televisions, you'll notice I'm slowly transitioning my entire wardrobe just to black dress shirts. It just makes my life easier. And uh, I used to just mostly have concert T-shirts, and they told me that I looked unprofessional. And by not us. We loved them. Who told you that? Not you, America, my supervisor. So I'm trying to look more grown up, and evidently black makes me look dangerous and tough. And a lot. lot. I don't look like I've gone outside very much in the last three or four years. My nickname in high school was Powder. Remember that show? You remember that? Yeah. It doesn't. Black doesn't. It's cool. I feel tougher. And here's the thing. I don't want to make any more decisions. And so if I just have a closet full of black shirts, then uh, be good. I did that once when I was in my first work in university and that show Bones came out and I just got all the white dress shirts and all like cheap black suits and I just dress like that all the time. It's very Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs of you. Well, so I'm not going to be wearing black shirts anymore, everybody. <laughs> not going to be doing that because uh, nope. I'm going to wear sparkly. I'm, I think we should go all tie-dye. I'm going all tie-dye and... <laughs> uh, no, I don't want to do tie-dye. Kelly's going to start setting the wardrobe, so whatever I wear from this point forward is going to be because Kelly decided it. Let's go to Rose in my hometown, Nashville, Tennessee. What's up, Rose? Hi, Dr. John. Thanks for taking my call. Thanks for calling. What's in the world is going on? How can I help? I am a fairly new listener, and I'm hoping to get your advice. Welcome to our gang. You, you you almost doubled our listenership. That's so good. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah, me and a few others. <laughs> so what's up? I am 30 years old. I am in an amazing relationship. I have a boyfriend of nearly two years. Um, we're very, very happy. Um, last year, um, I was the victim of a kidnapping, robbery, and sexual assault. Oh, my. And um, I'm so sorry, yeah. Rose. Thank you. Is that here in um, town? It, it was out of town, so okay. we, we moved afterwards okay. and um, good, tried good, good. to, you know, make Nashville a new home. Yeah. Um, so it's been a journey, and um, I am very fortunate and grateful to have found an amazing counselor that has started helping me on my healing journey. Excellent. And um, I was wondering how I can encourage my boyfriend to seek counseling to help him process this trauma for himself. <sighs> yeah, that's hard, hard, hard. First off, what if you're comfortable talking about it, what kind of paint me in context? What happened? Sure, sure. So I um was a rideshare driver and mm. I was picked up a passenger and um that p- passenger was really volatile. I didn't know and um held me at gunpoint and Mm-hmm. just for, you know, throughout the evening, just forced me into situations I was um, very traumatizing, very uncomfortable with. Yeah. And um, thankfully, um, I consider it a miracle. I survived. I didn't have a scratch on me. Mm-hmm. I wasn't shot. I wasn't beaten. I wasn't, um, like, physically um, harmed in any way other than than the sexual assault, which was, you know, a big deal as well. But, okay, good. I'm glad to hear um, so, you say that. Yeah. Yeah. So very, I feel very, very fortunate to um, be in a situation that I'm in and I, I have a great family that has been, um, you know, helpful. And I've found a counselor that's been fantastic for me. And so I feel like things are starting to move in, in a very positive direction. And I've been able to start that healing journey. And, Excellent. So what's, um, what's your boyfriend going through? Yeah, I think he knows, you know, the the gist of what happened. Um, Mm. I haven't been able to share in detail the story. And he's kind of asked that I I don't share that with him until he feels ready. And I want to be respectful of that. Mm -hmm. Um, But also know that, you know, this was a very big, um, you know, it was a very big situation for both of us. And 
um, he was the first person I called and, um, he was there on the scene with me, um, as the police were coming and, um, yeah, so he, he was very involved. His family was very involved with everything. Obviously everyone went with the ho- to the hospital with me and mm-hmm. just felt so loved and supported. And I'm so grateful for that, but also understanding that this was such a, a big impact to our relationship. Yeah. Um, and, and knowing that, um, you know, that there's, there's pain in the, in the trauma. So is he showing I, signs I, of depression, anxiety, frustration, anger? I mean, what, what, is he demonstrating things or are you just proactively reaching yeah. on his behalf? Yeah. Oh yeah. So he, um, he does have depression. Mm-hmm. Um, like he's been clinically diagnosed with depression and he's kind of just asked that I take it slow in mm-hmm. terms of, of sharing this, experience and, and the details of what happened. And so, um, whenever it kind of comes up in conversation, um, he gets really depressed and kind of shuts down. And, um, I can tell that there's, there's hurt there Mm -hmm. and he hasn't, you know, we, we briefly talked about him pursuing, um, you know, accounts like seeking a counselor and seeking some advice. And he's just like, yeah, I'll get to it when I get to it. Hmm. And, um, knowing that, you know, in my experience with trauma, it, the longer you let it sit, the the bigger it grows. Yeah. And so just wondered how I can, you know, lovingly encourage him um, to, to seek help. Yeah, man, he's lucky to have you. And I'll say on behalf of a guy who's got a wife and a mother and a sister and a daughter, um, and he's just a, one of your neighbors, um, I'm so sorry that you know this, but I, I, I need to say it, that, that should never happen. And yeah. I'm, you're a brave, courageous person to go get the help you need. And I'm proud of you. And I'm glad you're one of my neighbors now. Um, I'm so glad, I'm glad you're with us. Um, so I'm going to paint some broad generalities here. Okay. And if he's got existing diagnostics, I, I can't get into those, right? I'd have to talk to him, but broadly speaking, I've seen this play out multiple times. One of the most common things, and I'll, I'll take it com- out of this, this area completely and put it in a different context. Um, but it, it, it will, the same, the same general idea will apply. Okay. I've seen parents whose kid gets hurt somewhere, like in a sporting event or in a car wreck or something. And the parents are haunted by, I should have stopped this. I should have been there. That's my job. I got one job on the planet is to keep my kids safe. And I wasn't there for whatever reason. And 99.9% of the time, there's no, there would have been no reason to be there. It would have been insane for you to be there. But that's where our heads go, right? Mm -hmm. And so using that example and swinging it back, if he's like most boyfriends, rightly or wrongly, there's this overly... I've got my duty is to protect and serve, like that kind of stuff, right? Even though you you could possibly beat him up in a fist fight. That's not, it's not about strength and muscles. It's more about role and disposition. And I, I should have been there. I should have kept her safe. What I couldn't even, I can't even, right? And there's these moments, these traumas, these tragedies that happen that make us feel so small and really throw the curtains back. Like, you know, it's like just ripping the covers off the bed. We don't have control of much of anything. We're flying blind in this deal, right? The woman I love can be doing something as benign as taking somebody from IHOP over to a concert hall. And then this bad thing can happen doing that. You know what I mean? It makes us feel small and powerless. And some of us, when we feel small and powerless, we try to grab power everywhere we can. Right. I'm going to join a CrossFit gym and crush it and kill it and listen to Pantera and Slayer. And this will never happen again. And then often the other happens. I just fold up and I can't, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to hear it. I can't hear it. My body reacts, overreacts to the point it, it swamps my system. I can't do anything. So yeah. here's a, uh, the, the, the powerless truth on your part is this. You can't make him do anything. And that's right. Uh, for a woman who lost control, who is going to try to, I want you to watch this in yourself. You're going to have a tendency to grab control where you can have it because somebody stole it from you. Okay. And is that, am I, am I onto something with you? Totally. Okay. Definitely. Like, calendar, this, you be on time. You'd be on like, it, it, you'll find yourself doing that. And one of part of your trauma healing will be 
being able to, A, remember what happened, talk about it without your body re-experiencing it. That's the big one. But also mm-hmm. you'll be able to contextualize it. A bad thing happened to me for little to no reason. And yet I'm going to go about my day and learn how to be graceful and learn how to roll my eyes and learn how to laugh again, learn how to sleep again, right? To teach my body that it doesn't have to be on 24-7. That thing happened. And statistically speaking, it's never going to happen again, but it did. And you, right. you hear what I'm saying? Right. So that's part of the journey. You can't make him do that. And so here's what, the, the, what I would suggest is one or two gifts you have. You're okay. seeing somebody right now in, in, for mental health care. I would invite him. I would let him know. I really would like you to come to this with me. You don't have to say anything. You are a part of my life. I want you to be a part of my future. And so I want you to be a part of my healing. Not make this about him, but this is about you because you're the only one that you can deal with. You're the only one that you can control. So invite him to this. And I would let your therapist know. I want him to come. I need to tell him this story as part of my healing. I need him to be a part of this with me. And he's unable to hear it right now. And so I want him to be a part of this process. And what you'll hear is y'all will have to negotiate back and forth for a season. Um, as part of my healing, I need you to, to tell you what, so you'll know, fully know me. And he's going to say a part of my healing is I, I need you to be quiet. And y'all are going to have to navigate, and negotiate that together as you move forward. Having a counselor do that w- with you is really helpful. Um, okay. not every relationship needs that. This one sounds like it does. Okay. And that's a good thing for you guys. Cause what you're doing is you're learning a new language on how to have hard conversations with each other, how to be graceful with each other. And then both of you need to have that courage that you have right now. He needs to be courageous. And also you need to respect his boundaries. And there goes the circle, right? What you don't right. want to have happen, which I see happen all the time in this situation is you guys start comparing trauma and you start comparing grief. He's going to have something happen. He's going to get COVID. He's going to lose a, like a part-time job. He's going to have something and he's going to get down about it. And you're going to think, oh yeah, you want to know what bad is, right? And your right. body's going to turn him into the bad guy. Or you're going to start comparing grief. You're going to start thinking things like, good God, I'm the one this happened to. And even I'm moving on and he's going to be stuck in it. And he's going to be saying, I think you're psychotic. I think you're a robot. I think you've got problems if you're already working on your heal, right? So you're going to start comparing grief. You'll have to be really intentional about not doing that. Owning each other's mm-hmm. grief and owning the fact that y'all are going to heal differently. And here's the kicker. Y'all both got to get up and make your bed. You both got to get up and go to work. You both got to get up and do things that are going to keep y'all well. Does that make sense? You both got to go back yeah. to church. You both got to do those things that are going to keep you well and healthy. And so I think that can start with him coming coming back to coming to therapy with you, not coming back, but going to it. And here's one other thing. You've heard me say this a million times, and I'll say it a million times more. I would love for y'all to, you can't have these conversations sometimes with someone who's struggling with depression. The conversation overwhelms the systems, mm-hmm. but writing it doesn't. Okay. And if y'all kept a letters journal to each other that y'all share, I'm going to write what I'm feeling right now. I'm going to hand it to you. You can read it on your own time in your own place when you feel safe and you owe me something back. Okay. E- even if it's, I can't even right now, or this is so hard for me to even read. It overwhelms me. I'm not going to write anything back today. That's fine. Then we're, we're still, we're still communicating and slowly, but surely you might not be able to speak it in the same room with you and see you and remember back to the flashing lights and you in the hospital, but I can write it. And we're going to slowly communicate back and forth that way. And this journal may be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, it'll be something your grandkids read. And it'll be worth its weight in gold. Does that sound like something y'all can do? Yeah, that definitely sounds um, reasonable for us. Um, I think that's, I, yeah. I, I think that's fantastic. And I think those two things will get y'all down the road. There may come a moment where you say, I can't move forward with us. And this happened um, with somebody close to me. I can't move forward unless we sit down and have this hard conversation. You tell me when, but it has to happen. It has to happen soon. Um, Or I'm taking that as you choosing to not be in relationship with me. And if he can't hear about it, then, and you tell him this is a part of being in relationship with me is processing this trauma together then he has to go get the help he needs so that he can have that conversation with you or by not getting help, he's choosing out of the relationship. And that's going to be hard for everybody. Okay, let's start with the first two first. 
with the journal and with inviting him to therapy with you, to your counseling, for your challenges, for your healing, not for his, for yours, and see if he'll be a part of that. We'll be right back. Hey, good folks and friends and listeners to the Dr. John Deloney Show. The world is bonkers, right? We all know this. And one of the most common questions I get is, how do I find a counselor in the chaos? I've reached out and there's a six month waiting list or I can't afford it or they only take insurance or I can't get off work in time to go see somebody and it's way across town. What do I do? Because I want help with my anxiety, my depression, my relationships are hanging on by a thread. I want to be a better mom. I got to process this trauma that happened to me when I was a kid. Where do I find a counselor? So I partnered with BetterHelp because BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, even live chat sessions so you don't even have to look at your therapist when you're talking to them if you don't want to. I've taken away all your excuses and it's more affordable than in-person therapy and these are real licensed therapists. If you reach out to them, you will be talking to somebody within 48 hours. Dr. John Deloney Show listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Deloney. Please reach out if you need help. That's betterhelp.com slash Deloney. All right, we are back. Let's go to Mankato. Mankato, Minnesota, and talk to Chelsea. Did I say that right? Yes. Mankato? Yes. Oh, my gosh, I'm incredible. I should do this for a living. All right, so what's up? How can I help? Um. Okay, so... I'll just start with my question for you. Um, my husband and I have a special needs daughter, and she's completely dependent. Um, and I guess I've been struggling between wanting like personal accomplishments in a career and devoting myself to her. Mm. Um, and I guess I'm just looking for some insight on how I can find a balance that's most beneficial for everyone in the family. That's tough, 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 tough. What's the special need? Um, she has kind of a multitude of different things. Okay. She has a really rare uh, syndrome. And in addition to that, she's autistic. She's nonverbal. She has a feeding tube. Mm. Um, yeah, it's just kind of new since last year that she um, lost her hearing after meningitis. <sighs> So um, there's a lot of different things that we have to do for her on a daily basis just for, um, to get her through the day. Yeah. This is a, this is a hard question. Um, but I want to, um, so tell me, say, I don't really want to talk about that and that's, that's no problem. Um, <laughs> what is her prognosis? Is this terminal? How long does she have? Um, it's, it's more of a, a mental or, um, Psychological, a neurological? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's really unknown okay. because there's really only about 20 people in the entire world that have her syndrome. Hmm. So there's just not very much science behind it okay. as to where, you know, where her life is going to lead. Okay. And they all have a variability of, um, you know, disabilities and abilities. Okay. So. Man. So how old is she? She is eight. Eight. Do you, do you struggle with guilt? Do you struggle with, we did this? Um, I guess I, probably not guilt, but maybe a part of me hasn't fully accepted all of the, the things that she has to go through mm-hmm. every day. And it seems like when she gets over one thing, it'll be another thing. Right. Um, that adds on top of it. And it's, you know, it's not something that I guess I feel guilt with, but, um, I just didn't expect it really. And so, um, you know, I'm just trying to arrange my life in a way that is (laughs) conducive to everybody in the family. So, so you, you hit on something so important. And if you haven't done this yet, it would make you just like every, most every other parent in your situation I've ever talked to. Um, but I think it's the cornerstone. And again, this isn't, I don't have any neuroscience to back this up or anything like that. But I think this is the cornerstone to turn that corner and deciding what comes next. 
and you've heard me say this on the show, but grief is simply the gap between what I hoped for, what I wanted to happen, and what actually is happening. It's that picture that I thought was going to be when we found out we were pregnant and we found out I was going to be a little girl versus the reality at eight years old. Here's this kid and all of her struggles and all of her pain and all of her hurts and all of her frustrations. And I'll say it for you, I'm so pissed off and I'm so annoyed and I'm so frustrated and I'm exhausted and I miss my husband and I miss just kicking my feet up and watching TV and I miss random sex on a Saturday afternoon. I miss all those things because I've got, it's all of it, right? And there's that gap that we never stop and grieve and sit in it. We just run to the next thing and run to the next thing. And what happens is we run for eight, 10, 15, 20 years on adrenaline and cortisol. And eventually our health takes a dive. Our relationships melt. Our, as you mentioned, these dreams I had for myself, these career goals, these things I wanted to do, I just let it all kind of slowly drain out of the bathtub because I never stopped to say, I wanted this. I had this picture and then this is what I've got. And now what, right? Most of us won't do that because we feel like we're abandoning our kids or we're bad parents for saying, I wish you weren't wheelchair bound. I wish that you could get up and run around and play. I wish I didn't have to do all this stuff because you have um, hearing impairment and you have vision impairment and you have um, an inability to eat. I, I wish that we feel like if we say that, that we're dishonoring our kid and we're not. If we don't say it, we're dishonoring our own bodies. Okay. And so I think it's important to spend a moment, a season, some time in that gap. And that gap is hard. It hurts. It's brutal. Sometimes even saying it out loud will set off every mom alarm you have. And your husband joins every dad alarm you have. Um, How is your marriage through this? It's good. Um, My, so my daughter, um, she came into our marriage. I had her before I married my husband. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and so he knew about her issues and things, obviously, before we got married. And he's really um, just kind of, he dived right in to help me out with everything. And um, Pretty awesome guy, huh? Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Very cool. Very cool. So, so I, I would yeah. love to see y'all get together. No kids, no nothing. You all have other kids together? Um, we have a five-year-old son. Okay. Normal, just maniacal, b- bouncing off of things, five-year-old? <laughs> yes. That's, that's fun. So I would love to see you all get together and do a marriage checkup. How are we? How are things? What do you miss? What do you not like? Often folks uh, on either side of this equation, you know, mom, dad, whoever, get really invested in accomplishing a bunch of tasks all day. And couples can accidentally find themselves as great co-managers of their household, but really distant from one another. So I'd love to see y'all go spend some time together and just say, where are we? Check up. How are things? We got another diagnosis. We got another challenge. And then we got meningitis on top of it. And we thought we were going to lose her. And now she's lost her hearing. So now we have more challenges. Where are we? And then grieve together. And that might be grieving together. might be you writing a letter, him writing a letter, and y'all reading it to each other. Here's what I wished. I wish this, and it didn't happen. And then y'all can write that next one together. And I'm, I'm saying that one's, that one's more of, you don't really have to write a letter together, but then y'all say, what's next? And often, I'm glad you're not suffering from guilt. Often what I hear from parents of kids, especially, they feel guilty for wanting to go to work. They feel guilty for, well, I want my career. I feel guilty. They feel, well, feel- I guess there is a little bit. Okay, so you do <laughs> a have- A little okay. bit of that. I mean, I left my career- um, I was a lab tech and it just wasn't working because she has to go to therapy and things. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, I just don't, I had to have the flexibility. Right. And so I almost felt like I was choosing between like having the income or the success or whatever I envisioned for myself. And I, it's like, I had to give that up. It sounds selfish, but... No, no. See, and that's... Um, here's what I want you to be really weary of. And when you do some writing on this for yourself, when you start writing yourself letters, you start grieving this, you've got to be curious, not judgmental, okay? You have to say, huh, why, why do I get so mad when I think about the career I gave up? Not, I shouldn't be mad about my career, right? I don't want you to, to start labeling 
morality to these thoughts you're having. They're just your thoughts, man. And they're, they're a thousand percent valid. You're allowed to have those. It's, it's got to be, I can't imagine. Rap, I get frustrated when my kid's like four minutes late to a thing, right? When they won't find their shoes. I can't imagine having to quit my career that I loved or that I wanted to go far in because, right? That, I, that is natural. It's normal. Hiding that and squashing that and trying to shut it down will eat your body from the inside out. And that brings me to this. If you choose ultimately, after you sit down with your husband, y'all talk about what is and what's gonna be. If y'all say, this is the season that we're gonna try some in-home care and I'm gonna go back to work. Well, I am working. Okay. I just, okay. I, I took a huge pay cut. Yep, yeah. <laughs> so I guess that's where I'm feeling it. So I want you to look it's at the math bad. of this. Like if, if we have to get some in-home nursing care or some in-home nanny care, or we have to ultimately send our daughter to a home because we don't have the resources to, or the skill set or what to care for her, then let's have that conversation. Let's have that hard conversation that will be brutal and gut-wrenching and all that, but is this the reality of where we are? Um, I would suggest, you you sound like someone who would really struggle if, no, she absolutely knows where she is. She knows who we are. She knows all that stuff. I just don't really want to deal with it. You'll, you sound like someone who will really struggle with that. Is that fair? Um, yeah. I mean, it's constantly on my mind. Like okay. I'm not completely opposed to it. Um, I've had to get used to the idea of it. Okay. Um, just the fact that maybe she's not going to be in our home when we're not able to take care of her anymore. Sure. Um, but I, I've, I've been trying to, um, accept that, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Um, lean into that discomfort and lean into the discomfort of, I may need to get some help three days a week. I may need somebody else to help drive. And we're in a, we are in a privileged financial position to be able to do that. Or we work really hard and save on other things so that we can make this happen. And that's going to give me some space in my marriage. It's going to give me some space with my five-year-old. It's going to give me some space in my professional career. Um, but have the hard conversation. Most of the time in these situations, those conversations stay very hypothetical. And one person sits on all of that until they implode. And then the a house is just covered in contempt and resentment and ash. I, I would love to see you have those kind like, I really want to explore getting some help. Even if it's five hours a day for a for somebody to come in, skilled babysitter or something to come in and help. Or I want to have the conversation about a home. I want to have the, I want to have that conversation. Um, if you ultimately get down the road and you say, "There's no way I'm leaving my special needs kid just so I can go sit in meetings all day," I'm not doing that. That's insane. Don't apologize for that either, because I've heard that side too. Like I feel like I should be back at work, but I actually like being here, and I had to give a lot up. Right, so it's both and. I want to push on your one word, though. You're probably not going to find balance. That's mostly a myth. It's not real. You will find what yeah. works for you in particular seasons. You will never find an outfit that will work for 365 days a year. Sometimes you have to put on a coat. Sometimes you have to just wear a T-shirt. Sometimes you have to go inside because it's hot you'll never be able to find a system that will work forever. And so letting that myth of quote unquote balance go between work and home, that's just not real. What's real is in this season for the next 24 months, I'm gonna double down and try to go back to work full time and make a jillion dollars. And I'm gonna try the skilled nursing thing if we can afford it. I'm gonna give that a shot in this season. And then if she has another medical setback and she needs her mom, then I, for this season, I'm going to go back to part-time and I'm going to stay at home. And if you look at it seasonally, then nobody says winter's broken when summer shows back up. Or nobody says summer's broken when winter shows up. It's just the cycle. It's just the way it goes. I want you to do, th right. think of what's happening in y'all's world the same way. What is the next 24 months? Think in short-term cycles. What's the next 24 months? What's the next 36 months? What's the next year? What does that look like for us right now? And then what can I do right now to be successful in that area. And that might mean you gotta say no to some stuff. That might mean that I'm gonna spend less time with her and you know, push them, push over to somebody else. I would lean, lean towards that road and I would let the word balance, just let that go. It's a myth, it's a vapor, it's not real. And we kill ourselves trying to get it. We buy a bunch of stupid day planners with millions of ribbons in them and all kinds, whatever. Let it go, let it go. You're a good mom and that baby girl's lucky, lucky, lucky to have you. And it sounds like your job's lucky to have you too. 
Go out with your husband. Y'all pick this thing apart. Spend some time in grief. Spend some time in the pain of, ah, I wanted that. But this is, and then y'all can make some hardcore decisions about what comes next. We'll be right back. For too long, we've avoided the hard conversations about mental health, relationships, and the food we eat. And I don't want it to be true either, but it is. The quality and quantity of the food that we put into our body, it matters. And oftentimes we're forced to decide between cheap food that's good for our budget or expensive food that's good for our family. But there's a company that solved the problem. Greensberry is a family-owned meat provider working with farmers and fishermen all over the country. They sell organic grass-fed beef, free-range poultry, pork, lamb, bison, and sustainable seafood. Their meat is less expensive than what I can get at the grocery store right down the street, and they deliver it to my door. Now listen, I'm a lunatic about meat quality, and this is the stuff I feed my family. So go to greensberry.com slash Deloney and you'll get 10% off your first purchase. Check it out today. Your nutrition is worth it. All right, let's go to the city that destroyed my childhood, St. Louis, Missouri, and talk to Michael. Hey, Michael, what's going on? Hey, Dr. John, how are you? I was an Astros fan and I could never get out of the playoffs because you guys... Albert Pujol, y'all ruined my childhood, so I hope y'all are happy. You guys and the Braves, hope that was fun for y'all. So what's up, man? Um, so a couple of weeks ago, my daughter had an unfortunate accident where she lost part of her finger. Oh, and, no, what happened? Uh, she got it stuck in the spin bike um, downstairs, oh. so they weren't able to, yeah. Oh, my. So, Gosh, where, where, was, where, where is it? Where, which part did she lose? Like one uh, knuckle, two knuckle? Top, the top knuckle, okay, the fingernail, that okay, part of it on her ring finger. Oh, um, I'm so sorry. She okay? Yeah, she's she's doing fine physically. Okay, um, she it's it's gonna heal fine. She's gonna have most of her mobility with it. Um, but she, uh, I'm more worried about her her mental state mm. than anything. Yeah, with it, um, because um, she's five, and um, you know it's it's hard for me to put myself in her shoes as how she's actually dealing with the, the, the issue that, you know, the trauma. Yep. And, and so, you know, when we were in the ER, we were honest with her. We kind of talked to her, kind of gave her what was happening. And I don't know how that resonated with her. And so, um, when we did the vaccine shots, she was very petrified of the getting the shot. You know, she built up this in her mind as far as how scary the needle is, but yep. she has a high pain tolerance like when she runs she falls she gets up i mean she wasn't like screaming because she lost her finger it was when um she kind of built up that in her head of what was kind of going on and so um what really kind of sparked me to kind of reach out to try to figure out okay how do i how do i talk to her how do i help her through that side was when we went to the the follow-up appointment for them to look at it and they took the bandages off i mean she was screaming her head off for uh with, without really any pain that you could tell. Cause I mean, they weren't even touching her hand. Right, and right. so it's, it, and when we put the bandages on at home, um, it, it, it's a huge ordeal. There, it's a, a lot of uh, pauses and breaks and stuff like this. It takes both my wife and I to, to do this. And yeah. it's like, it, it, we, we try to talk to her through Like, Hey, we're just changing the band-aids. So I don't know what's going through her mind. And I think there's, there's anxiety there. Yeah. And, and I just don't know how the five-year-old mind is thinking about it. And so man. what I should be doing and how to, how to relate and how to talk to her. You're a great dad, man. She's lucky to have you. It's awesome. Thanks for the call. So from this point forward, I want you to get the idea that a five-year-old is thinking about things out of your mind. Okay. okay. Um, you and I at our age would be thinking things. She's five and essentially she's responding. So mm-hmm. she remembers people around her body. Let's, let's go there. Her body remembers that hospital. What happened? It goes in those okay. lights, that tile floor, those sounds, those beeps, the all everything in her body screams, run, get out of here. Cause remember last time. And the last time mom and dad were huddled around her finger saying, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And kids absorb our attention. Here's a great example of this. It worked beautifully. It's one of the times me and my wife were on the same page. My son was outside running around. He was probably four maybe or five. 
and he tripped and dude, he face planted on a brick planter box outside, right on the corner, just drilled him right in the widow's peak. And if you've ever seen a picture of me, I look like Eddie Munster. I got a dope widow's peak. He nailed it and comes inside and you know, head wound, it was spurting blood everywhere. And I, I, he had watched UFC fights with me. And so we had already talked about, it. he had a little bit of language of understanding that head wounds just bleed naturally. Cause it's your body saying, Hey, watch out. This is important stuff up here. This is where the eyes in my brain are. Right? So he walks in, his head's got blood dripping on his head. And my wife and I both looked at him and without even saying anything, we both started cheering. We both went, yeah. And so he instantly stopped crying and kind of froze there for a minute. And I was like, dude, you got a head thing. And he's kind of like smiled and was like, ah. he was just confused because there's blood coming down his face, right? And we went and looked and we wiped it away. And like most head wounds, it was a teeny tiny little thing, but it just bled profusely, right? But both my wife and I, we knew kids absorb the adult energy in the room. And mm -hmm. your daughter remembers when last time, when this thing actually kicked off and it hurt, I mean, that searing pain and remember how scared and terrified mom and dad were. And every time y'all are going to do the Band-Aid thing, she can feel mom and dad tensing up for the fight. And that sets off, I'm not safe, not safe, not safe, and here we go again, okay? So I want you to not think of her, and I need to tell you, dude, I've made this mistake for years until I sat down with some child therapist, and I felt terrible. I felt awful, especially for my son. He got the brunt of it because he was younger. By the time my daughter came along, I, I had learned some new things. I would blame him for thinking things, in his three-year-old brain or his six-year-old or seven-year-old brain. And take that out. So coming back, this will take some time for her to heal. And I would just say, be patient. Be patient and not overwhelmed and not, right? This is going to happen. And she needs to understand we got to change these bandages. Okay. Uh, a couple, here's a couple of things you can do when it comes to the bandage changing. Kids crave boundaries. They crave autonomy and they crave safety. And those things don't often work together, right? Boundaries make yep. a kid feel safe, but autonomy, I get to choose. That doesn't always align with, well, you, yeah, but you can't run down the street, right? Because you're gonna get run over. So here's a quick thing you can do. You can offer two things and let her choose them. Would you like this Band-Aid or this one? And do you want to pull it off? You want dad to pull it off? Or do you want the puppy dog to pull it off? She gets to choose. We're still pulling that thing off, but let's give her a little bit of wiggle room in there. Have y'all tried that? I mean, we, we've done, we've given her the option of, hey, do you want mommy or daddy to do it? Okay. You know, do you want to sit on daddy's lap and, and those kind of things? Sure. Um, is kind of, Cause that's, we've, we've gone down that path. So maybe pick which popsicle do you want? And I, man, we're dealing with some trauma here. And so I don't mind putting a popsicle up there or which music do you want to listen to? Um, or mm -hmm. when we get done with all of this, do you want to dance to this song or to this song? Like whatever the things are that work for her and just know mm -hmm. that those aren't going to be magic fixes. It's going to okay. be kicking and screaming and clenching and mom and dad helping. And then mom and dad are going to instantly drop your shoulders and y'all are going to start cheering and you're going to grab a popsicle and all three of you are going to have one and you're going to celebrate this thing together and then we're going to go to bed and dude, in about two weeks, you're going to be so annoyed by this and about two days, you're going to be annoyed by all this. Can we just please change the freaking bandage so I can get back to my show, right? This is a long arc on this deal and it just sucks. It just is, but she's been through some trauma. A lot of the trauma is because of the pain. A lot of the trauma is because of the blood. A lot of the trauma is because of the hospital stuff. But I'll tell you, mm -hmm. some of the trauma is also, she's never seen mom and dad scared like that. She's never seen mom and dad cry. She's never seen mom and dad terrified or tensed up like that. That's new. She didn't know she had that kind of power, right? And that's scary for a kid. And so you guys coming in with, you know, you got to hold tight and you got to, but we're going to do it not, we're not going to prep for war. Um, I want to back out. You know this. And so this is just two dads talking here. Kids are ruthless with each other. Brutal. They're the worst. Right. The worst. Mm -hmm. And some yeah. of your concern now, I'm guessing, just as a fellow dad, is projecting. You know what's coming for her. You know right. some crappy little kids are going to make jokes about it. They're going to peg her as the girl with the, you know, they're going to just say all kind of mean, crappy things. And you know that's coming. Yep. And so we can do one of two things. I can shield her from it. Or I'm going to get on Amazon. I'm going to find some books 
um, that are written for kids who have limb loss or have some sort of, you know, physical exceptionalities. They're going to look a little bit different. I'm going to read her those books so that she can see herself in out there, right? Because right now she feels yeah. like the only kid with. I'm going to show her. Right. No, there's other kids out there with. I'm also right. going to trace our hands and I'm going to trace my finger down like hers. And we're going to show how cool hands are and how beautiful she is. We're going to teach her how to tell the story. And here's why we're going to tell that story. And we're going to tell that story at home. You're going to maybe ask her more like, hey, tell me what you remember about that. Do you remember what happened? Have her tell her you that story. And if she says, I don't want to, that's fine. But we're going to teach her to tell that story so that when she's nine yeah. and she's by herself and two idiots on the bus, she's going to say, yeah, dude, yeah. I got my finger stuck in a bike and it tore the top off. I'm freaking hardcore. Or, right. you, you know what I mean? We're going to teach her that resilience. Yeah. And the resilience doesn't come from flexing. It comes from storytelling. It comes from, dude, mom and dad love each other and they love me and they think I'm beautiful. So, uh -huh, I don't care what you think. You, you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, like, so I have, I've started reading a book called The Whole Brain Child. Uh-huh. Um, not sure. And it basically talks about how building, like, you know, talking about those past memories and bringing those things up, but she seems to shut down Yeah. when it, when we try, when we try to have that conversation, is that just because it's so new in her mind that we need to kind of let that it, heal, it, you know, like let, let that pass a little bit to, to start engaging in that, to, to talk about that. that it, incident, everything. That about, yeah. Everything about her finger is chaos. Everything yeah. in her finger sets off every trigger she has in her sweet little brain. Mm -hmm. Mom and dad aren't safe. House isn't safe. I go to the hospital. I don't want to talk about it. I don't. I want out of this thing. Every mm -hmm. time mom and dad look at the finger, they they squint their eyes. They go, they go, mm, they go. Ah, everything about it is is is, is whoa. And that's yep. where story helps norm things. Like it just is. Mm -hmm. It is. Yep. And so maybe y'all can color together, and you can begin to trace your hand where you have tucked under one of the same fingers she has, and you could say man, my hand is not near as cool as your hand. Or right. look, my hand's like your hand. Look out, mm -hmm. like we're cool, right? And so what you're doing is you are talking the story. We're not laughing at at all. We're not making light mm -hmm. of, we're not minimizing. We are simply saying, I see all of you and I still love you. Both hands. Right. You don't have to hide anything from, old, from, your, from your ding dong old dad because I love you, right? Mm -hmm. And even right. so, I, I'm going to continue to talk about this. Eventually she'll talk about it. Eventually, you'll she'll, you'll hear she'll hear you talking about to your wife. I cannot believe how strong and resilient and gritty and beautiful that little girl is. She's gonna hear those yeah. things and hear those things, and then when y'all play, um, you can reenact it. That's child play therapy, right? Where you know one of her dolls gets her finger caught in a thing, and you can look at your, your daughter and say, "What do we do?" And then her daughter yeah. can help be a part of the healing process of that little doll, and she begins to gain autonomy over this thing, right? So you hear what I'm saying? We're going to slowly norm mm -hmm. it in the house. This is a new is in the house. We're not going to shy away from right. it. We're not going to shuck away from it. It's just going to be the new is. I just would be really careful about forcing her into things right now. That finger is just yep. radioactive. It's trauma. And let's yep. let mom and dad be the, the, the big ones around there. R understand this. Kids are going to be ruthless. They're going to get onto her. All children suffer from body image, from I'm different, and this idea of wholeness. I'm no longer a whole person. And that's right. where you teaching her that wholeness doesn't come from your body parts. Wholeness comes from the inside out. Yeah. And cards and little gifts and let's go serve other people. Show her that she's got function in the world, that she's got purpose, that people need her around. And man, that's just going to become a story for her. You hear what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. And what what about like, you know, the the joking of it like if you know if you can joke you know i've heard people talk where you if you joke about yourself others can't make fun of you like is, is there anything I, there is that's or, how i handle problems that's not how my yeah. wife that's not how my wife handles problems yeah and part yeah. of my humor is a defense neck mechanism because i'm pretty insecure um some yeah. of it is because i just naturally i mean that's just how my body handles traumas by cracking up and laughing about it my wife doesn't yeah. and so um Maybe you laugh about your role in this. Can you believe daddy cried when his little girl got hurt? Can you believe daddy cried? Right? Maybe that's the joke. Mm -hmm. that. Um, but if she's not down with laughing at it, I wouldn't make it a joke. I would let her offer that as a joke. Okay. If you get hurt gotcha. at some point, which you will, you'll 
hurt your knee at noon ball or you'll, you know, I don't know, have a lawnmower or something. If you do and you choose to make jokes, that may give her permission to. Um, but I wouldn't okay. force her into jokes about it. I wouldn't tease her about it, no. I, not yet. Not as not oh, as yeah. a six-year-old. It, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's it's just been, it like, we have an older child, and he's more logical. And uh-huh. He's very emotional. And so if able to have more direct conversations with him about things or with her, it seems to be on that emotional track. And it, it was trying to get, I'm just I, getting on the same playing field with her as far as, like, how to relate to her and, and communicate with her has been... Also kind of, I felt like a struggle for me. It's like, I feel like I'm missing something when, with yeah. her is how she reacts to these things, which we, is how I've seen him react to things. We are all about, we're very few conversations, a whole lot of hugging. Very, very few conversations, a whole lot of, like, I'll just tell you, you know what I did last night? Uh, I crawled, my daughter set up this wolf den under our kitchen table. And I was on all fours under the kitchen table with my daughter and some little animal she had and I was the wolf king and she was the wolf queen and we were protecting the baby from I don't know what armadillo I don't know what was going on outside the cave um that's connection right that's she doesn't need me to lecture her on how much I love her she needs me just to be um and I would tell you this about your son one if he hasn't experienced trauma you'll see emotions when he gets when he has that trauma and the second thing is often highly intellectual young children are hiding behind their intellectualism, okay? And so in the same way that you want your daughter to slowly start to come around with those, like, what's actually real here? Like, I, I hear your feelings and we still have to change this Band-Aid. I want you to lean on your son the other way. So you have some very logical reactions to this. What's happening inside your body right now? How do you feel about that? Yeah. Right, and lean on him the other way because we were looking for balance in our kids. We're looking for they can do both, right? Um, Right. But I I tell you what, brother, man, your kids are lucky, lucky, lucky to have you as a dad. All dads out there, I hope you'll, man, step up to the plate like Michael is. You're a good man. Get on Amazon and find some of those children's books. And you'll, I don't know, I, I don't know if there's one called So I Lost a Finger, but you'll find some that have some sort of loss like that and you'll there are pictures of kids still playing ball still running around having fun still laughing still going to birthday parties and that social norming for a kid is everything everything we'll be right back do you feel like you're always busy doing something list chores work stuff kid stuff pet stuff all of it but you're never getting anywhere in the areas of life you really care about Like in your relationships with friends, taking care of your body, connecting with your spouse, a romantic partner, loving your kids. Then it's time to look at the things you're doing and how your actions are keeping you from where and who you want to be. If your actions aren't working for you anymore, that's okay. Now's your chance to get up and choose differently. And that doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, in my new book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future, we'll walk through a common sense approach to mental health and wellness, including steps to change your actions and move you closer towards the person you want to be. JohnDeloney.com to start creating the life you want. That's Own Your Past, Change Your Future at JohnDeloney.com. All right, we are back. Um, Man, if you've been listening to this show, you hear me ranting and raving about my new book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future, that is out in Into the Wild. And man, um, the feedback has been, I, again, I keep saying that, I, I never could wrap my head around this. Um, this is the most nervous I've ever been about anything, putting it out there. And uh, the reception has just been something else. I'm so, so grateful. Um, I want to take a second, something I touch on in the book here, and I've gotten some Pushback on social media, some a lot of accepting, exception, accepting, whatever on social media. Then I found myself, why am I, why am I even checking in and out with social media? I want to talk about where we are as a society, as a country, when it comes to this idea of friendship. And I think we get lost in social media and this and that, and the digital and the tech and all that, and the metaverse. And I, I just want to drill it down until. Literally until like 15 years ago, friendship, the idea of tribe, the idea of community, the idea of we are in relation with one another, that had to take place with people in a room. I could write letters. There is 
ample evidence of people writing letters throughout history that are beautiful and great and I love reading books, you know, of old letters. That's all, all great. But all of those interactions pointed people back to when we are back together. And so I had to, if I was going to be friend, if I was going to be in a tribe, if I was going to be in a community, if I was going to be a neighbor, I had to endure the awkwardness and the ugliness of human interaction and choose to remain anyway, or I had to remain anyway. One of my great mentors, Richard Beck, Dr. Richard Beck said, what if we lived our lives as though we could never move? How different would our conversations be if that my neighbor was always going to be my neighbor? If the church I go to was always going to have to just be my church, how different would my, would my conversations be? Would I be less ragey? Would I be less judgmental? Would I be less angry and running around and like, I'm out of here. I'm going to the next. If that was the only restaurant I could eat at, would my conversations be different, right? And now instead of hanging out in person, disagreeing in person, you know, and never questioning whether they're going to show up tomorrow, boom, overnight, friendship changed. We moved the whole enterprise online. And we traded quality of friendship. We traded this interaction for quantity. And we're drowning in shallow water now. And again, I'm not jumping on the I hate social media bandwagon. I've, I think I started. I never got on the wagon in the first place. It's redefined the word friend for us, right? And now a friend is a curated person to, who reports hating the same things I hate or you know, carrying the same bag I carry or liking the same workouts I like. But we engage with them on their terms and they engage with us on our terms and from far away. And our relationship is made up of comparing and sharing and judging without the discomfort of doing it in the same room. And that discomfort is iron sharpens iron is really, or I didn't really mean it like that. I meant it like this, or let me push back on that. Right. And that's not to say that some in online interactions aren't real and deep. In fact, there's some studies that show people are willing to vomit more. They're willing to be more honest online quicker, right? There's just not a lot of gas in the engine of that relationship over time. Those meaningful inter interactions, me telling you a whole bunch of stuff about myself or me texting you a bunch of pictures of me with no clothes on while they're giving you information about me that you wouldn't otherwise have had. It's not real friendship. It's not real relationship. Real relationship is showing up. Real relationship is being present. It's being fully seen and fully loved. And the story that digital friendships, digital relationships are equivalent to real life relationships, it's not real. It's not real. And I've heard this. Um, I'm going to hang out with Gary Vee one day and, and we'll I'm gonna have a good discussion about it, a good debate about it. And um, I've, I've not met him. People in the building are friends with him. They say he's great. He's an incredible human. Where I disagree with him is on this issue is he says that, man, people have been saying this forever. Like, oh, you're the kids in the phones and the, in the, the, you know, the tele, once they put telephones in every house, kids are going to just all go to, and all the way back in time, man, if we give these kids books instead of just the oral traditions, they're going to be ruined. And then now with the metaverse, right? We're going to move all of our, I'm going to take out loans or use credit to buy f imaginary curtains in an imaginary piece of real estate in a fantasy land. Like in meta, in a thing that's not real. And he says, oh man, and he's not the only one, I'm just picking on him, but he's not the only one, but it's just the same old thing. And in 10 years, we're going to wish for the simplicity of our cell phones because then we're going to be wearing those, you know, XLR headsets and we're going to be living in the metaverse and all this. And we might be, that might be true, we might be. But here's where I think it's different. All of those other things, letter writing, books, this telephone in the house, it all pointed back to, Real people getting together in a real room. I got on the phone so that I could tell people when I was going to be at the mall. I got on the phone so we could talk about that guy so that when we were at school tomorrow, when we all showed up on the same team, when we all showed up at the work together, it all was about going back to the same room, to the same place, to reconnecting. Now it's about, hey, we're doing this whole other thing where we never have to be in the same room. We never have to connect. We're going to outsource all of it. We're going to wallpaper over all the discomfort and feelings and create a whole new universe. I don't feel like I'm winning in the real world, so I'm going to create a, a imaginary fantasy land where I think I can compete and win. And don't make, make, make no mistake, competition is wired into our DNA. It just is. Comparison is wired into us.
That is who we are. That's how we saved, survived. And so it will translate here. There will be people who've got cooler imaginary curtains and imaginary cars and cooler imaginary houses and cooler imaginary muscles that you can buy or upgrade or whatever, whatever the thing will be. So hear me say this in no uncertain terms. Being well involves real people in person, someone to sit with us when we're hurting, bring us a meal when the world's on fire, laugh with us until our stomachs hurt. Someone who shows up when our kid has passed away, when our mother's sick, when our wife is in the ER, and they say nothing. They just show up. They just sit with us, right? If we're not intentional about cultivating those relationships, look around. This is what we get. Half of the country in some sort of clinical diagnostic with anxiety, depression, half of the country screaming at the other half of the country, people blaming, yelling, screaming. That's what happens. I will go on record as saying, I believe the chief, the chief enemy of our time is loneliness, is lack of connection, period. Full stop, end of story. The rest of the stuff, all, all the pain, hate, anger, frustration, all of it stems from that. We got to cultivate those things. If we're not intentional about it, look around. The loneliness will poison us. And so in my book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future, I talk about this, but more importantly, more importantly than just labeling the issue, we walk step by step. Here's how to go make friends. And I know that sounds trite and lame and silly. That's where we are. That's where I am. How to go make friends. How do we stay connected? How do we build those relationships? How do we say, okay, I buy it. I get it. The what I'm doing isn't working and going further down that is not working. What do I do now? Do we lay it out? My good buddy, Kevin, man, I, this book is for him. It's for me. It's for him. He said, Deloney, I turned all the screens off and now I'm just sitting in my living room staring at my three daughters. What do I do now? My buddies all moved away. What do I do now? This book is for that. This book is for him. This book is for you, right? I'm going to cover this story and a bunch of other stories in this thing. If you pre-order today, you'll get a ton of bonus items, a ton of stuff. I think, is, are we still in pre-order here? Yes, okay. So it's not out into the wild yet. It's almost out into the wild. Still can pre-order it here, even up to a month of free therapy with BetterHelp. It's good stuff, man. They've stepped up to the plate here. It is time. It's time. Go to johndeloney.com to pre-order Own Your Past, Change Your Future today. I believe in this one. Go check it out. All right, and as we wrap up today's show, my good friend, Randy Lynn there in Oklahoma. Yes, ma'am, this is for you, my sister. This, book, this song is for her. It's called Surface Pressure off the uh, Encanto soundtrack. Is it El Canto or Encanto? Encanto soundtrack. We actually got married, me and Randy Lynn. She was... Uh, the stand-in at my wedding for my wife when we couldn't see each other, but we were in rehearsal. We didn't really get married, but that's a whole other weird story. So, written by Lynn manuel Miranda, the genius, genius, genius. The song goes like this. I'm the strong one. I'm not nervous. I'm as tough as the crust of the earth is. I move mountains, I move churches, and I glow because I know what my worth is. I don't ask how hard the work is. Got a rough, indestructible surface. Diamonds and platinum, I find them and flatten them. I take what I'm handed, I break what's demanded, but under the surface, I feel berserk as a tightrope walker in a three-ring circus. Under the surface was Hercules ever like, yo, I don't want to fight Cerebus. Under the surface, I'm pretty sure I'm worthless if I can't be of service. A flaw or a crack, the straw in the stack that breaks the camel's back. What breaks the camel's back? Get connected, y'all. We'll see you soon.